Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And I want to welcome you once again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to greet you on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself and everybody that's involved in Bible Talk. Amen. So we're continuing on in our study uh, looking for true biblical faith in these perilous last days. Amen. Okay? And before we start... This broadcast, Mark is going to ask God's blessing upon our time. Yes. In the Bible it says, for the joy set before him, Jesus went to the cross. It also says, pick up your cross daily and follow me. And I say this because, Lord, we want joy and peace with, we, we want your peace and your joy that what we might learn from your word that we might put in our heart and peace and joy may come from it. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, I want to I start this by, first of all, asking you a question. You know the answer probably, so let give them a chance to answer. Answer, okay? What's the world's oldest profession? <laughs> well, if you listen to the world, you're going to most assuredly have answered incorrectly. Right. The world's oldest profession is gardening. That's right. Cultivating. I was going to say that. Or, sh or, or being a shepherd. No, no, no. It's not being a shepherd. No, the oldest profession is is being is being a gardener, being a cultivator. It says in Genesis two fifteen. This is in the very beginning. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. That's the That's right. very first profession. That was the first job that man was given. That's right. Okay? Now, I grew up in New York City, in Manhattan. So, I promise you, I don't have a lot of natural understanding of farming. All right? I didn't grow up around farms at all. He still I, doesn't. I, no, I, I still don't. And yet, I, I, I've mentioned before that I do seminars on biblical principles for pre professional, personal and professional growth. And one of the seminars I do is a city boy's guide to growing strawberries. Mm -hmm. Because the Lord gave me real understanding about cultivating. Because you see, when it comes down to it, whether you're growing a marriage, or you're growing a business, or you're growing your own life, everything works the same way, and it's all about cultivating. And you know what it says in the Word? We're going to cultivate faithfulness. Okay? And when it comes to that, when you look at what goes on out there in a farmland, it says in Romans chapter 1, Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, His, God's invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Amen. You see, we get understanding through what has been made. Yes. We're supposed to have a spiritual appraisal of all things, okay? Now, I mentioned this, and I'm going to just throw this in. Uh, out on the patio here of our apartment, mm -hmm. Alice has a sweet potato. Actually, she is she, she's three of them in one pot. I didn't know it was quite that bad. <laughs> all right, so Alice is growing a, a, a sweet potato. She's much more given to that kind of thing than I am. The only flowers I like to grow, I say, are, are plastic ones. They're they're easy. Okay, that's you just have to dust yeah. them, right? So, but I asked her today in the middle of a conversation. I said, "Where did that? Where does a sweet potato begin? Where does it come from?" Mm -hmm. And you said, "In the garden." Yes. Meaning the Garden of Eden. Yes. Where do, where does where does sweet potatoes originate? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's close. All right. Now this is what I want to talk about. Okay. It comes from. What it, originally, it comes from a seed. It has to come from a seed. Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Because all life comes from a seed. Mm -hmm. Whether we're talking about human life, mm -hmm. or animal life, or plant life, 
It all starts with a seed. Yes. Now bear this in mind, because this is really, really, this is really important. For the Word of God says, the eternal Word of God, the Word of God that is true, through the Holy Spirit ministering through Peter, he said, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring Word of God. 1 Peter 1.23 The Word of God is a seed, and all life comes from that seed. Where did the sweet potato come from? I'll tell you exactly where it came from. It came from a word. It says in the first chapter of John that nothing came into being except it came into being through him, the word of God. He spoke it into existence. That's right. All right? You have to appraise things spiritually. Now, if we're going to talk about gardening, let's go talk to the carpenter. <laughs> okay. Who knows more about gardening than the one we call the carpenter, Jesus Christ? Nobody. He brought everything into existence. Who knows more about fishing than the carpenter? Ask Peter and Andrew when he when Jesus told them, go out and cast your nets on the other side. All right? He knows, he, he is the font of, of all knowledge, the Word of God, all right? So Jesus, when he teaches parables to give us understanding of what we're seeing, right? The first thing he does is talk about well, I shouldn't say the first one, but the most important one is the parable of the sower and the seed. I pray that you're all familiar with that. I'm in Matthew 13, but it starts in Matthew, in Mark chapter 4, verse 14. Go, go to Matthew 13. Jesus said, the sower sows the word. Now, when he talked about this parable of the sower and the seeds, Jesus said, if you don't understand this, you're not going to understand any parables. You're not going to have understanding of anything unless you understand this parable. And it starts by, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you know that parable of the sower and the seed, if you don't know it, please become familiar with it after this study, right? Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Matthew 13, 24. So this ever-important parable starts with talking about gardening, planting a seed. Okay? Mm -hmm. And remember, right after that, I mean, okay, I, I said that Jesus had said, uh, if you do not understand this parable, how will you understand all the parables? Right. So you got to understand this. And then there's a parable in that same chapter of Mark, Matthew 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Yes. How does that start out? In Matthew 13, 24 and 25, it says, Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. So all everything is coming from seed, and we understand, we are supposed to understand that the seed that brings life, that germinates and brings life, is the word of God. You were saved because you heard the call of God's voice. Because you're saved by faith, right? Yes. Not of works. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I mean, this is all so logical. You hear people out in the world tell you that the Bible is... A, the Word of God, the Bible, is the only logical thing that this world has ever experienced. Well, it's truth. So, you have a seed, you plant the seed. What comes next? From a seed, the seed gives birth to a root. Yes. It, it germinates, I think is the right term, yes. right? And, and, a, and a root grows. And now, the root is where things really begin to happen. Yeah. And this is, this is true, but it's on the ground. You don't see it necessarily, right? It's like when a human being, a seed is planted, and that baby is formed in his mother's womb by the Lord God. Check Psalm 139. Mm -hmm. But we don't see it, because that's the root of that life. Right? Yes. Where does the word root come from? I'm glad you asked, Mark. <laughs> the dictionary defines it as of or going to the root or origin. Well, you know, I've said that from the very beginning of this study. 
that we're trying to get back to the root of true Christianity, right? Or it also defines it as a person who holds or follows strong convictions. If you're not a person who holds strong convictions, you are not a bondservant of the Most High God. You are not a child of God if you don't hold strong convictions. You had better believe it and confess it that Jesus Christ is Lord and that you have been saved by the grace and mercy of God the Father who gave His only begotten Son. That had better be a strong conviction because it will be tested in your life. The word radical, because we're supposed to be radical Christians, comes from the Latin radix, which means root, or radicalis, which means having roots. We have allowed the devil to rob that word, and radical is only bad people. Well, I'm going to tell you something right now, and I make no bones about this. I am a radical Christian. Not quite as radical as Jesus was, certainly not as radical as, as the Apostle Paul or some, but I'm working at it, I promise you, because it is my desire to be as radical as them. It's locked into the root. But if you want to know somebody else who is truly radical, how about John the Baptist? Yes. Yes. And I want to talk about this as part of the root of our faith, mm -hmm. right? Let me tell you something about the ministry of, of John the Baptist. But first I want to read this from Matthew chapter uh, uh, 11, and I'm reading verses 7 through 11. Okay. As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John, John the Baptist. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. What was his ministry? Well, the angel Gabriel, who met John's father Zacharias in the temple when he was performing his high priestly duties, this is what Gabriel said about the child that would be born, John. He said, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Luke 1, verse 17. So John, right? Yes. It's about John's ministry yes. was to prophesy and make a people ready by calling them back into a right attitude. The attitude of the righteous. Sentence. So listen to this now. If John fulfilled that ministry, and he did to such an extent that Jesus had boasted of that, right? Mm -hmm. It says, Now in those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, 1 and 2. Yes. That was his message. Yes. Repent. And this is the message of true biblical faith in these perilous last days. I'm going to read you three verses. I want you to think about these now, right? And John the Baptist. Jesus, these are, these are the words of John the Baptist I'm going to read now, right? right? From John chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent him to the priests and the Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, who are you? And he said, I'm not the Christ. Yes. Because what was important was who he was not. Exactly. And then, a few verses later, it said, John says, speaking of Jesus, it is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. John 1, 27. And then, the next day, John 1.29 says, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, repentance, it is not only about, it's not only about turning away from sin, but more importantly, turning to Jesus. Repentance has no value whatsoever if you turn from your sin to yoga or Buddhism 
or become a Confucianist or confused, or good works. Repentance, which means to change your mind and turn, means to turn, yes, you're turning away from sin, but you have to be turning to Christ. Otherwise, you're still going in the wrong direction. Only Jesus, that's why John pointed to Jesus, okay? Because he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He points to Jesus, because only Jesus takes away sin. Period. Period. There is no other way. And his message, the message of Jesus Christ, in Matthew 4, 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word of God is the seed that gives birth to a root that is a work of the Holy Spirit. The children of God, the saints, the people whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, the bondservants of the Lord, the remnant, that's us. And that's who that message is to. Yes. Okay? All right, now the next thing is, so we've gone from the seed to the root, because that's what happens. You plant the seed, it germinates, and it becomes a root. And from that root, well, then the next, you know, the next thing? It has, it has to go from, from root to fruit. Right. Or at least leaf. No, no. Because it needs no, 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 no. That's not the command of the word. The word is that we go out and bear fruit. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. All right? So it's got to go from fruit, from root, from root to, to fruit. fruit. So that's why John the Baptist said, therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It's not enough that you repent. Now you have to bear fruit in accordance with that repentance. This is the Word of God. It's clear. It's simple. It's, it's true. Logical. It's logical. So the message of repentance is the Word of life. That's what, that's what it said, First Peter. Remember where it started, right? But think about what that message is. I'm not the Christ. That's right. And that word, by the way, in the Greek and in the, in the Hebrew, means anointed. Right. You hear a lot of people talking about they are the anointed. Well, the fact is, John the Baptist said, hey, when, they the get, when people came to John the Baptist and said, who are you? He said, I'm not the Christ. He was not prepared to take anything from Jesus. For I have died and my life is hidden in Christ Jesus. That's supposed to be the attitude of the righteous that John the Baptist was sent to lead us into. And then he said, I'm not worthy. Humility. humility. You are not going to have a relationship with God unless it is based on humility. And it starts with repentance because repentance is the recognition of the fact that you're not the anointed, that you're not sinless, that you're not perfect. It, Repentance is a confession of the fact you need help. That's right. Because you can't save yourself. Mm -hmm. It is based on humility. And there's not an awful lot of teaching in the church today about humility. That seems to, to, to have gone in the 60s with the me generation. Mm -hmm. And then the simple fact is, and I'm sure you know this if you know Jesus Christ, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through Him. That's the disciples. Now the simple fact is, this is what offends the world so badly. Because they don't mind you having Jesus as long as you recognize, well, there's other ways. You know, if I, you, okay, that's, that's good for you, but I do this. You know, I, I'm a nice person. I, give, I, I send a check off to this charity. Every, you know what? Only through Jesus Christ. No man comes to the Father. It is, it is exclusive. If Jesus is not your Lord and Jesus is not your Savior, you are not going into the kingdom of heaven. Period. So that repentance in that case is not turning all the way back to Jesus. If, if you don't turn it's, to Jesus. It's like right. Satan has come along and distracted you and you're off into another path. Right. So, okay. Well, I really, what I'm trying to get to is the importance of Repentance. Yes. Now, repentance only comes because of the Word. That's right. If you close yourself off from the Word, you're not going to ever repent. You're not going to be willing to see yourself, okay, as you actually are. And you're not going to be able to see 
the gift of God in the fact that he is willing to transform you, to change you, to bring you from glory to glory, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so the work of the believer today is the ministry of reconciliation, mm -hmm. proclaiming that repentance is available through the grace and mercy of God. Isn't that what Paul said? Now remember, Paul had said to the Corinthians that he had determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. But then he writes to the, later, and he says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5.20 And the only way you can be reconciled to God is through the atoning work of Jesus Christ on that cross of Calvary. That's the only way. There's nothing that you can do. Not of works lest any man should boast. It is the free gift of God. Amen. Alright, so now, the last couple of weeks, two weeks ago we talked about the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a little shocking to some people to realize that there is in the Bible a commentary not only is there a, the account of the Red Sea, commentary. there is God's commentary on the Red Sea. Yes. And whereas most of the people of God, Jewish and Christian alike, celebrate that event as this is so wonderful, God says that it was witchcraft, that it was rebellion. Yes. Because they needed to see his delivery, deliverance before they would respond. They did not act in faith. And that's why, okay, the people that God had delivered out of Egypt, right? Had delivered. Not that he was going to do it. All right? When they, when they, when they were at the Red Sea, one or something, they had been delivered. They weren't going to be delivered. They had been delivered. All right? They grumbled and groaned and complained and wanted to go back to the world. Back to Egypt. A lot of Christians today want to go back to the world. Yes. Once they saw the salvation of God, just like Moses said, stand by and see the salvation of God. Then they got to the other side through the parted waters. And when they got to the other side, they sang and they danced and they had a jubilee. They praised the Lord. But they did not make it into the promised land. You want to know something? Three days later, they were grumbling and groaning and complaining again. Okay. So I asked us the other day, so don't answer it now, but I asked us the other day of a, of a group. I said, what was missing between the Egyptian side of the Red Sea and the other side of the Red Sea? I mean, these people went from their, their lack of faith and their grumbling and complaining. They went to one of, through the parted waters, one of the greatest miracles of all time, to the other side and praised God. What's missing in this picture? The answer to that question is repentance. They didn't repent. Do you want to know that you can praise God and not have repented? You know what? It's pleasant to praise God. Everybody's going to praise God. You can take the worst sinner. I don't know who you want to think of. Think of Adolf Hitler. Let me tell you something about Adolf Hitler. Okay? I don't... I'm, I'm going to say right off the bat, I don't know where he is. Because, as I understand, he committed suicide in the bunker. Put a gun up and pulled the trigger. Well, if between the time the bullet left that barrel and it hit him in the head, if he said, uh-oh, and repented and turned to Jesus Christ, wound up, we'll meet him up there. Is it likely? I can't answer that question even. Because you never know. Think about the good thief that was crucified with him. The good thief? Yeah. He repented. He repented. Yeah. Well, that's what, okay, that's the, the, the term I understand what you're saying. No, he I repented. Yes, he repented. Yes, yes. At, the, at the last, he repented. It's not too late. If you're drawing breath, it is not too late. No matter what you have done before, no matter what your life has been, it doesn't matter. You can turn to God right now and enter into that promise. Okay? All right, let me go back now, get myself back on track. If I ask the question, what, what was lacking? What was missing in that trip through the parted waters that got them from the place of complaint to the place of praise? What was missing? And, I, and, and nobody answered this. Nobody saw this. 
Repentance was what was missing. And because they didn't repent, they carried that sin on with them. And they continued to mumble and grumble. they continued to mumble and grumble and complain. They had not been healed by repentance. Okay? Why didn't the people I asked see that? I'll tell you why. Because by and large we have been come we have become blind to the truth of our need for repentance. Yes. There are so many people filling pews and praising today who have truly not repented, not changed their minds, not been transformed by the renewing of their minds, because all too often the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers filling churches no longer preach the need for repentance. Yes, that's right. They'll tell you what a nice person you can be, how you can be healthier, how you can be wealthier, how you can be this and that, have a better job, have a better home. Build up self-esteem. But where is that message of John the Baptist? Where is that message of Jesus Christ himself? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I'll tell you why it's not happening, because it was prophesied that it would be this way. Paul wrote to Timothy and said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. So repentance is like the root of that seed going down. That's it. So, the, so well, you got the seed of the word, you got the root, which is the repentance, and then you can get the fruit from the tree. Your life becomes the fruit. And it won't tip over. Well, I'm, I, no reason it should tip over. Right? If you got roots, but if it doesn't, it'll not well, tip it, over. It if it, the root is, the, the seed is the word, the root is repentance. Okay? It, it's like building a house. Jesus said in the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it's like building a house on sand. If your relationship with God is not built on repentance, there's no root. There's, there's no, no foundation. There's no foundation. There's no root, and you're going to tip over. Mm -hmm. When the storms come, brother, you're going to blow away. All right. But now, what I'm saying is, once again, I believe with all my heart, it is time once again, uh, and this is all about making ready a people prepared for the coming of the Lord. And the people then, like the early church, they were instructed by Jesus. And it says in Mark 6, 12, they went out and preached that men should repent. I will tell you that I have had the opportunity, and I've mentioned this many times here. You know, Alice and I, for, for near 40 years, we've been traveling and ministering in churches and countries and different places. I've been to, I have been to churches where they refuse to preach sin and repentance because it turns people away, turns them off, makes them feel bad about themselves. And we live in a time of self-esteem. You want to know something? If, you, if you're concerned with self-esteem, get over it. Get over it. Seek the approval of God. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. It matters that you hear those words, well done thou good and faithful servant, when you come face to face with Jesus Christ. It matters how He esteems you. And how much He loves you. When you know that, you won't have a self-esteem problem. So let me just tell you this. Consider... Are you living a life of that humility, of that willingness to repent? Because it's an ongoing thing. If we sin, you know what I know something? We need to confess it to Him. We need to repent. And He is faithful and just to forgive it. Oh, yeah. yes. And now, like those early disciples, we need to too, we also need to go out and bear fruit. So Father, I pray that you will embolden us. Yes. The word that you have placed in us, that seed, Lord God, of your love, of your word, Lord, that it would germinate, that it would explode forth and bring forth new life, that it would just bear fruit in our lives and through our lives, Lord, for the glory of your name. What I started to say was, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's Amen. the truth. God bless you and goodbye. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners